The Holy Gospel for the evening is taken from the sixth chapter of the Gospel according to St. Mark. I invite you to stand for the reading of the Gospel. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went to shore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. When they crossed over, they came to a land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about the whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was and wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Let us pray. Settle over us, Lord, with your Holy Spirit, that our hearts would be open to hear from you. Grant this blessing, Lord, because we need you. We need to understand you. We need your help. But most of all, we just need to be with you. Open us, Lord. Amen. My cousin Ralph and I were inseparable as kids. And, you know, between us, we had an uncanny knack for getting into trouble. He was two weeks older than I was, and he was actually much more creative and much more free at getting into trouble than I was. I was sort of usually the follower. One summer day when we were six years old, we'd been playing together outside all day long. And the week before, Ralph had experimented with setting bonfires. So for whatever reason, that particular day, he decided that we should set a bonfire just feet in front of the big fuel tank for the farm. My uncle had a big fuel tank so that he didn't have to run into town every time he wanted to fill up the machinery. So we started a fire in front of that fuel tank. Now, I have to say that I don't know whether there was really a great risk of there being an explosion because I don't know, maybe those big tanks are protected from accidental fires. And I don't even know what type of fuel is in it, so I don't know how explosive that fuel was. But I can tell you this, when we got that fire going good, we were both scared, and we took off running and hid in the barn. Like if there was going to be a big explosion, that would protect us to be a, you know, surrounded by hay. That was a good plan. We discovered, however, that my Aunt Lucy came running out of the kitchen to put the fire out, I think what we really discovered is that she was actually paying more attention to us than we realized she was, and of course, we were in trouble. As an adult, I can look back on that time, and I can still remember being afraid, but now as an adult, I have realistic fears about that, and I have realistic learnings about that, at least two things I learned. For one thing, South Dakota summers are hot and dry and windy. And there is always a great risk of a prairie fire. And when a prairie fire gets going good, it will burn for hundreds of miles sometime. I personally remember one that burned seven miles wide and over 150 miles long. So there was, even if not a risk of explosion, there was a great risk of starting off a big prairie fire. And that would have changed our lives of everyone, not just us children, but the whole family, all of us would have been changed by that. But the second thing I learned was that sometimes we get ourselves into things that we really can't get ourselves out of without help. We just have to have someone come along and literally pull our feet out of the fire. I think that's uh, a big learning in human experience. One day there was a cardinal and he was praying in the cathedral and a young, very enthusiastic priest came up to him and said, 
your eminence, there's a woman in the chapel who says she's seen a vision of the Lord. What should we do? What should we do? And the cardinal said to her, look busy, my son, just look busy. Well, when I look at life, I think that this is human nature that we're talking about here. There are so many times in life, aren't there, where we come up against things that we're facing. They might be challenges, or they might be something that frightens us or just plain annoys us. We may have caused them ourselves, or someone else may have caused them. But the reality is that we have to deal with them, and sometimes we're just inadequate to deal with them on our own. Add to that the difficulty that often enough, the things that we do to try and solve these problems really amount to nothing more than just looking busy. They're not really solving the problem. They're just what we think we can do, and it's not very effective. And that's really sad, because one of the things that I've learned in my life is that when we're in trouble and when things are difficult, those are times when it's best for us to turn to the Lord and get help and comfort and strength and sometimes a little kick in the pants when we need it in addition to that. Over the years, as I've experienced more life, I've begun to recognize that my purpose in life is simpler than I thought it was when I was younger. I now know that the reason I am here, I don't mean in this congregation, but I mean in my life, is to love Jesus with all my heart and mind and soul and to love the people that the Lord has placed into my life. And that when I do that, the more I do that, the more and more life kind of falls into place and the better my life works as a result of that. Tommy Tui has three daughters. He's crazy about his daughters. You can tell it if you read any of his writings that he really just is really crazy about his daughters. And he also says that his daughters have taught him a lot about his relationship with God. He tells the story of one day he was at home trying to get some work done, and the littlest daughter just kept hanging around all day long. And he kept asking her, what do you want? And she would say, nothing, Daddy, I just want you. And this went on several times, and finally he said, okay, go get in the van. He jumps in the van with her. They drive to the toy store. On the way to the toy store, he asks her again, what do you want? She gives him the same answer, nothing, Daddy, I just want you. When they get to the toy store, she has so warmed his heart that he is like willing to buy her anything. And so he says to her, just go pick whatever you want and I'll get that for you today. So you know what she picked? A little jar of soap to make bubbles. And when she picked that, he said he knew that she really meant what she said. She didn't want anything from him. She just wanted to be with him wonder what would happen in our lives if what we wanted more than anything else was just to be close to the Lord, just to be near the Lord in the Lord's presence. And I wonder what would happen if we were able to occasionally at least set aside those things that distract us and that keep us from connecting with the Lord. I think we might be surprised how our lives would change. And not only would they change, but I think that we would have then the key to being satisfied with our life. General Larry Nelson tells a wonderful story. He says his favorite joke from the Cold War era was a joke that circulated around Russian um, military and political leaders. Here's the joke. It is said that Adam and Eve were Russian. They had no clothes they had no house, and they had only apples to eat, and their leaders told them, this is paradise. Ralph Barton, a famous cartoonist, killed himself, but before he took his life, he left a note and pinned it to his pillow. His suicide note told about all the great things that had happened in his life. Nothing bad had ever really happened to him. He'd always been successful. He had great friends. Everything had gone his way. He said that he had gone from one wife to the next, from one house to the next, and that he had traveled in all the greatest countries in the world. And in the end, he said, I am just sick and tired of trying to fill 24 hours every day. In other words, he was just bored with his life, and so he ended his life. You know, it seems counterintuitive, but I am convinced 
that we are a culture that is at one and the same time too easily pleased and yet deeply dissatisfied. By that I mean to say that we often accept things that really won't satisfy us, things that are temporary, things that are finite, things that are just touted as being the latest thing that you need, but they really cannot satisfy us. You know, things like having more money in the bank or the biggest car or, you know, some new diet fad, whatever it might be, and we think that's going to satisfy the ache or the hunger that's in us, but the reality is that it cannot because that ache is really coming from our need for God. We need the infinite. We need the permanent. We need that which is ultimate. And when we try to fill our ultimate needs with temporary and finite things, we will always end up dissatisfied. And I think it has more than just dissatisfaction at risk because it is not just dissatisfaction, but it is also our sense of security. Probably most of you know that one of my favorite cartoons is the old Peanuts comic strip. And one of my favorite comic strips in the Peanuts comic strip is Linus having a conversation with Charlie Brown. Linus says to Charlie Brown, he goes to bed at night, he's all alone, he starts hearing the coyotes make their noise in the yard, and he he begins to be depressed and lonely and afraid. And Charlie Brown says, but Linus, I thought that if you held that blanket, you were secure. And Linus said, I think the warranty has run out. If you hang on to and you, you cling to anything which is not God, anyone which is not God, and expect to get your security from that, you will soon find the warranty has run out. Your fancy alarm system, your great beepers on your car, whatever it might be, they will not keep you ultimately secure. Security comes in the one who can raise you from the dead and bring you back to life, bring you into new life. And that's where your security is. We live in a world that is not only dissatisfied, but is placing its security in all the wrong places. Fortunately for us, our God is a gathering God. And our God is very much at work in the world. Some evidence of that is just the very fact that you're sitting here tonight. I mean, you paid, you played some part in this gathering. I suspect that there were at least some of you who set a clock for your nap so you wouldn't oversleep, so you'd be on time for worship tonight. And maybe some of you planned yesterday to come tonight, or you said to yourself, well, I can't be up early in the morning, but I'll come this evening. So it was that it's all a part of that. You got cleaned up, you got into your car, You came here, all of that's your part of that. But behind that, drawing you here, is the beckoning God who is constantly at work in our lives and in our world to draw us here. And God's agenda to bring us here is always to put us in a place to receive healing and hope and wholeness. And that's because that's God's nature. God is by nature a gathering God whose purpose it is to bring hope and healing and fullness and wellness into our lives. That's not our nature. I mean, our nature is to forget and stray and get all wrapped up in things. We have to be, you know, pulled our feet out of the fire and to go through the motions and to look busy and hundreds of other things. But God's nature is a nature that draws us constantly to healing. You see this in all the texts that we read for this evening, but it's especially in the gospel text. In the gospel, Jesus and the disciples have gone off to a quiet place by themselves. They did that for two reasons. One is because Jesus' cousin, John the baptizer, has been executed and they're grieving. You know how exhausting grieving is? If you've ever been grieving, you know that it takes time and it requires others to help you with grieving to really fully begin to come back to the place where you were prior to the grieving. And maybe you never completely let go of all of that grief. But one thing is for sure, quiet moments with God is very healing and it can calm and settle the exhaustion and the hurt of grieving. 
And then the second reason that they need to go to a quiet place is because they've been out working in the field, in a place where they get often rejected, in a place where Jesus even warns them, you have to knock the mud off your feet and go to the next place because that many people are going to not want them around. And that's exhausting. Maybe some of you are in a situation in your work life or your home life or something going on in your life that just makes you feel like you never get any encouragement and, and it's hard work just getting through every single day. A quiet time with God settles and calms those kinds of traumas as well. So after they've spent time with God, then they get ready to go back to work. And their work is to gather people to Jesus that people might be healed and made whole once again. And so they get in the boat and they go across the sea and they get off at Gennesaret. That's Gentile territory. So on the surface of it, it should seem like there wouldn't be much response to them over there. After all, the Gentiles didn't really care that much about some Jewish rabbi walking around teaching, but their response response is different than might be expected because if you remember Jesus has already been to Gennesaret that's where Jesus healed the guy in the graveyard remember the crazy demoniac who broke the chains and he's running around the graveyard naked and nobody can catch him and pin him down and Jesus heals him and when Jesus healed him the people were so terrified that they sent him away it's just a reminder to us that sometimes, even though God is willing and able to heal us and bring us wholeness, we just aren't quite ready for that. We're not quite willing and open to the healing that God can bring. So after Jesus healed the demoniac and the people send Jesus away, the demoniac comes to Jesus and says, please, Master, take me with you. I don't want to stay with these people. I don't trust them. They don't like me. They remember what I was. They think I'm going to go back. He doesn't want to stay among them. And Jesus says, no, you stay here in your town and be a witness to me. What, just can you see what a great job he did as witness to Jesus? Because when Jesus comes back this time, people aren't afraid of him. They don't run from him. In fact, they flock to him, knowing and trusting that he can heal them. All that demoniac did was live his life as a healed person, filled with love for Jesus, and it brought Jesus to people in a way that was profoundly different than the first time. So you too can be a part of the gathering. You leave this place not to tell people how bad they are or how broken they are. That is not a good witness. You leave here instead just living in the kind of healing and hope and wholeness that you get from God. You walk out these doors and you live a little bit more healed than you had been before, a little bit more touched with the goodness and grace of God. And people see that and they say to themselves, there must be something about this Jesus guy. And eventually you become part of the gathering yourself. And if you watch your life, you will notice that there are people in your life that are open to a relationship with Christ, not because you badger them about it, but because you live healed and loved by the God of grace. So this week I was thinking about how very little time I actually have to talk to you during a sermon. Now, I know you're sitting there thinking, man, this thing is going on forever, right? <laughs> but... You, you probably, if you know me, know I have more to say than I can say in the period of a sermon. So I have to make a choice. I can choose, I suppose, to berate you about being sinful and broken. I can remind you of your own um, fires that you've built in your life and the times that you've just been going through the motions or been looking busy. I could spend my time doing that, and because I am sinful and broken, I think I'm rather expert at that, and I would probably do that well. Or I could decide to make you feel guilty, and because I have a lot to feel guilty about, I could probably do that job pretty well, too. Or I might give you a false hope by trying to convince you that you can earn your own salvation, that all it really takes is just for you to be a nice person, and that's where your salvation comes from. But I can't do any of those things because none of them are gospel. 
I can only speak in the gospel way of speaking, which is to say, I appeal to you. I invite you to love Jesus with all your heart and mind and soul, to love Jesus more than anything you can imagine, to want Jesus more than all the stuff that our culture has to offer, to seek Jesus every day in every situation. Because I am completely convinced that when we do that, when we live in that way, things begin to fall in place more and more. And more and more, our life begins to work. So will you let the gathering God gather you? It's really up to you.